exist when we uplift one another and when we work together. And when we think about this exemplary human being, I personally find it insulting when we hear Republican leaders like Speaker Ryan invoking his name on this day when the Republican Congress as it stands right now in their agenda is doing everything that is diametrically opposed to what Dr. Martin Luther King represents and fought and gave his life for. It is insulting to us that believe truly in equity and justice for everyone. So we know that this journey isn't over. We know that the work and the struggle is still long and it is hard. Um, and we have a lot to do to eradicate that systemic prejudice, racism, that inequity that exists. That it is up to us to take up that mantle and take up the fight. So we in the city council have been proud to fight on behalf of policies that combat inequality, racial inequality, socioeconomic inequality, and gender inequality. That we're gonna stand with all of those who fight for this each and every day, like Congressman John Lewis, our civil rights icon, someone whose life and work some misdirected souls have tried to defame. We stand with him, with all of those representatives like Adriano Espaillat, who refuse to normalize hate and bigotry by not participating in the inauguration. We stand with our leader, Senator Chuck Schumer, who has a lot of work ahead of him and needs our support to bolster him. We stand to defend President Obama's legacy, which this administration seeks to destroy and erase. So as we prepare for the uncertainties that lie ahead, now more than ever, we must recommit ourselves to standing up for what is right, because we won't lose hope. We refuse to lose hope. All we have to do is think about the struggles of Dr. King and Lewis and others that have fought before us. I stand here in solidarity because the fight that he fought was a fight for equality for every, every one of us. Every step, obstacle standing in our way will only make us stronger. And I like to look at, look at quotes that have not, use quotes that have not often been shared very frequently. One of Dr. King's was, I think is very appropriate for this moment in time, as most of his work is as well, but that the hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, and brotherhood. So let's continue to be inspired. Let's continue to march on, march on, march on towards justice. Muchas gracias. Palante, siempre palante. Thank you so much. As I stated earlier, we opened today and showed the, both the mayor and Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand the National Action Network NAND Spectrum Lab, where we are going to be dealing with the question of teaching, training, and working with young people around literacy in terms of technology. This came out of an MOU and an agreement made with Spectrum, National Urban League, National Action Network, and others. And because I want to kick it off on King Day, the chairman and CEO of Spectrum flew in to be here and opened it with us. We cut the ribbon in the back. That's why you see a lot of movement back and forward. Uh, he and uh, Rhonda, where's Rhonda Critchlow, who's the head of diversity, please stand, Rhonda. I would love, before bringing on Chair Lady Cousins, I'd love to hear from the chairman and CEO of Spectrum. Y'all that used to be time wanted, y'all in the Spectrum now, but this is uh, from Charter to, to Spectrum, where this is the chairman of the board of Spectrum who has kicked off this lab 
with NAN's partnership. They're doing 25 around the country. King Day is never a better day than to break down barriers. We don't build walls, we tear walls down. Tom Rutgers. Thank you, Reverend, Reverend Trump. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you for the partnership. Uh, you know, a year ago when the Charter was coming together, we were purchasing Time Warner Cable and Bright House Networks and essentially bringing three companies together. And Charter was the small company, relatively speaking, to the size of the companies we were buying. And we met with uh, Reverend Sharpton and uh, um, Mark Morial from National Urban League and others about crafting a memorandum of understanding about the kind of commitments our company wanted to make going forward. And we had always been believers in diversity, and we've always had a workforce that represented our communities that we serve, but we were going to become a much bigger company, and we wanted to institutionalize our commitment and our relationship as a very large company going forward. And so we signed that memorandum of understanding, and it was really uh, an understanding that uh, we would make commitments, that we would make formal commitments, that we'd be able to measure those commitments and live up to those commitments. So I'm really honored to be invited today to share with you this special day as a company, as a corporation, as a, a, um, a person who serves this community. Um, and uh, it's very gratifying to, to be included. Um, you know, we want to build a great company. Uh, we have three legs of the stool that we think holds us up as a business, and one is our products and our pricing and our packaging, and how we make everything we do come together. And the other leg is creating service, quality service as a product. And uh, one of the things we're doing We've committed to hire 20,000 people over the next four years in the United States. We just opened our first new call center in New York State. Um, and part of that process is to improve the quality of the jobs we do. And our experience is that if you have very high quality service, you get very good long-lasting relationships with your customers that pay for the quality. And so we're big believers in that. And the last leg of the stool is uh, our connection to the communities we serve. And it's as critical as everything else we do. We have 92,000 people working for us today. Um, we're about to go to 120,000 people when we make these employment decisions. And there's a lot to do with training and development. And we've made commitments uh, to the communities we serve, not just to hire people, but to do the labs that we just dedicated today, which are designed to teach people the skills necessary to use the broadband network. And if you think about the broadband network, it's almost like the printing press 500 years ago. It has the potential to change everything, but not only is it a great opportunity, but it's a disruptive opportunity, and people are left behind by the change. And one of our goals is to work with community groups throughout the country and to bring people along and to use those facilities and to use those capabilities that we're developing so that the, everybody benefits um, from the progress that we make technologically. And lastly, I'll just say that uh, this is just the beginning of the change. Um, the company that we've created is going to build high capacity, low latency, high compute networks. And what that means is the nature of communications is going to change dramatically in terms of the capabilities. People think about it as virtual reality and gaming, but it's not. It's really going to be the way we live and work and the way we communicate and the way we build our communities. And so um, thank you for including us today and uh, thank you for celebrating uh, with me uh, a special holiday. Dr. King inspired me personally uh, you know, to end legal racism is such an accomplishment, but even more than that is the hope that was created through his life and the hope in the future. And I think uh, every day I think about the possibilities in front of us and, uh, and it's so wonderful to be hopeful. So thank you very much for including me.
Praise the Lord. We, we have been joined by several leaders from the state, New York State Assembly and Senate. And one of those is the leader of the Democrat Caucus. And she is a friend of the National Action Network. Let me Sharp. say before we bring her on, I just want to, I'm, I'm going to let he and Katrina and I going to preside the rest, but I just want the press to take note, on 145th Street at NAN, Chairman Rutledge announced 20,000 jobs that they were going to do. If he had announced it downtown, somebody else would have taken credit on Fifth Avenue for the jobs. <laughs> I want you to know he's keeping a commitment. I did not bring in 20,000 jobs and make America great again. He did that and let him get the credit for that. The head, the head of the Senate, New York State Senate Democrats, Sister Beloved, Andrea Stewart Cousin. Good afternoon. I am so happy to be here because we are in an incredible, incredible time. First of all, Reverend Sharpton, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for when many people were sleeping, you knew we had not a moment to sleep. We had not a moment to rest. We thought we had gotten to some mountaintop. And there are those among us who always understood how fragile that mountain could be. Thank you, Reverend Sharpton. You know, I come here as not only a celebrant of Dr. King, but a byproduct, as many of us are here of that dream. I grew up in Manhattan. I grew up in Amsterdam housing. Mm -hmm. My father was a decorated World War II veteran. Right. Bronze Star, Purple Heart. Whoa. But he was a black man. And when he got out of the service, the GI Bill didn't apply to him. He didn't get the, 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 the education. He didn't get the home. We got public housing. And my mother, who typed 100 words a minute, she couldn't get a job in corporate America. She was part of what Adam Clayton Powell Jr. did in Congress to make sure that corporations started to hire black people. She typed 100 words a minute, and she wound up getting a civil service job in New York City. She became the legal secretary for the Corporation Council in New York City because of civil service. That's what government did. I had a roof over my head because government did it. I, my parents couldn't get what they needed because government did it. I went to public schools because government said we could. And as I grew up, I realized what government could do. Dr. King understood what it could do too. That's why he spent so much time talking about elections and voting because your vote matters. Because elections matter. Because when you have an opportunity to, to, to vote for somebody who's keeping you down or vote for somebody who will bring you up, guess what you do? You vote for the one who will bring you up. And they understood that. And that's why people fought so hard to keep black people from voting. Because we realized that when you voted for people who would come in and represent your interests, things would change. 
And we know that when Dr. King walked that walk, he didn't walk it in a way that people were applauding him because he had to fight and struggle. This was a new concept for an old pathology that they didn't want to change. And Dr. King, despite all that you heard, you know, my great friend, Attorney General Snyderman talked about, and, and Melissa Mark Viverito and Chuck Schumer and everybody who came up, all that he endured so that we could exercise that right is something we cannot forget. I never thought growing up in the projects that I would be a senator. My parents didn't have any reason to think that I would be a senator. Nobody did. And they weren't looking for it, they weren't promoting it, and they weren't supporting it. But by the grace of God and the path that has been set forth with Dr. King and those like John Lewis who have shed their blood, lost their lives, I stand here. And not only do I stand here before you as senator, I stand here before you as the leader of Senate Democrats in New York State. The first woman leader in the history of New York State. Uh, two of my conference members are here more. Um, Jamal Bailey, newly elected from Mount Vernon, and Senator Kevin Parker, who is no stranger to Nan. My conference, my conference represents seven million people. My conference represents black and brown communities from Buffalo to Brooklyn. Our elections matter. When you look at the map, and Dr. King understood how states matter, everything he started, he started locally. It matters what we do here in New York State. We can talk about being progressive, but I want to say to you that right now we can do more. There are two Democratic conferences in New York State. We could be one. When we are one, we get to move the needle statewide. <coughs> Let me explain how well the Republicans have done this. If you look across the country, the Republicans control assembly, and Senate, 25 state houses. You know how many, how many Democrats control? Four. <laughs> New York could be one of those places. And I'm not saying that everything Democrats do are right, but New York could be one of those places. But the Republicans have figured out how to work with some Democrats, so that they continue to control power. 32 Democrats were elected out of 63, which means we could be in the majority. And we would not continue to have the perpetual conversations. We could raise the age. We could make, instead of instead of an executive order, the bill that I carry to make a special prosecutor the law of the land could maybe get passed. We have managed, as Eric Schneiderman said, to repeal Rockefeller drug laws when Democrats work together, to strengthen MWBEs when Democrats work together, to start paying the Campaign for Fiscal Equity dollars that are due our children when we got together. We can do so much more when we work together. Yes. And what we have to understand is that the progress that we make is gonna be on a state-by-state -state basis because we know what we're facing on the national level. We know we're gonna to have to push back. 
We know that we have to be the barrier to protect our most vulnerable and to keep Dr. King's dream alive. Yes. That's what we are charged to do. So, as everybody knows, four years before we get to do, to do this again on a federal level, but on a state level, every single day, we can march, walk, push, protest, argue, support people right here in New York State who support our agenda. As Dr. King said, we can face finite disappointment, but we can never, ever lose infinite hope. As long as we, the descendants of the dream, live, there is infinite hope. Thank you so very, very much. This next speaker, has been a friend to Nash Action Network. We have worked together on many progressive causes. Many of us remember the first time he came was to deal with the issue of K2, which was ravaging our communities. And he came, there was leadership on the state level provided, and now we are dealing with that issue. He led on the issue of protecting our immigrants from the, the Trump deportation squads. When Trump promised that he was going to ship out 11 million people, this friend said, we're going to put up the money that the state needs to protect our immigrants. No matter what that bill is, we're gonna pay it. When it comes to criminal justice reform, he's leading as it relates to raise the age. We are one of two states in the nation that criminalizes children and prosecutes them as adults. We can't call ourselves the leader, progressive leader of the nation when we are locking up children as adults. When we're charging our kids and throwing them in adult prisons and expecting them to come out whole, we cannot call ourselves a progressive state. And this man is helping to change that and to reshape and reformulate what's happening in Albany. He's no stranger to us. Let's put our hands together and receive at this time the president, the chairman of the Independent Democratic Caucus and my friend, Jeff Klein. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Floyd. Happy King Day, everyone. Well, uh, I'm certainly uh, no stranger to uh, the House of Justice, and I want to say a, a very special thank you uh, to Reverend Shopton. Uh, Reverend Shopton and I first met uh, probably uh, over 20 years ago. Uh, I was a young assembly member and uh, representing the Bronx, and I think we all know the murder that took place of Amadou Diallo uh, in the Soundview section of the Bronx. And uh, the Reverend uh, mobilized uh, against police brutality mobilized against community policing. And uh, I was uh, one of the few uh, that decided, along with Al Sharpton, get arrested uh, in a show of civil disobedience. And uh, Reverend Sharpton never forgot that. And uh, it was a, a tough decision for me, uh, but it was the right decision. Uh, this wasn't a decision uh, that was very popular uh, in the district that I represented uh, in the Bronx. But I always remember Reverend Sharpton saying, uh, you have to do the right thing not the political thing. Uh, but I will say that Reverend Sharpton made a very kind offer. He said, because you do this, uh, this is gonna hurt you in your next election. And he said, if you want me to, I'll endorse the other guy. Uh, but no, he endorsed me, and uh, I was victorious and uh, was reelected. But I think all of us here uh, understand the legacy, especially now, of Martin Luther King. Uh, it looms so large and inspires us uh, to continue his work in civil rights and social justice each day. But it also, besides celebrating the life and work of Martin Luther King, uh, I think it also incumbent upon us to ask the tough questions. We continue to have to ask, why is it that when the foreclosure crisis took place, that African American homeowners were four times more likely to be facing foreclosure? 
We have to ask the question, why is it that we have this digital divide and African-American children are still not likely to own their own computer? Why is that? We have to ask the question, whenever we have an economic downturn in our city and state or across our nation, African-Americans are disproportionately unemployed. We have to ask that question. But you know something, it's not incumbent upon someone like myself or my partner in the Independent Democratic Conference, and I want you to give him a hand, everyone. He's the new chairman of the Banking Committee, the first African-American chair of the Banking Committee in the New York State Senate, Jesse Hamilton, everyone. Because it's not incumbent upon us to sit on the sidelines just because the election uh, didn't turn out the way we hoped. Uh, because things didn't turn out uh, the way, I guess, we planned. It's incumbent upon us to continue to fight. And I pledge to you today, I will continue to fight. And continue to fight for the issues that we all care about. You know something, uh, Martin Luther King, six months before he was killed, uh, actually gave a speech at a high school in Philadelphia. He spoke to students and he asked them what was their life's blueprint. He spoke to those individuals and he made a very, very, I think, important comment. He told them to shoot for the stars, to, for the stars, be educated, work hard, stay in school. But he also said, if life deals you a different career, do that career to the fullest. And his famous words were, you have to set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. And then he said that you have to street, if you have to sweep streets, sweep streets like Shakespeare, Shakespeare wrote poetry, or like Michelangelo painted. You know, if we think about that for a moment, those are very, very important words. Uh, those are words of inspiration. But right now, unfortunately, in New York State, young people of color aren't inspired. We have a law on the books, and we have the dubious distinction of being one of the only states in the United States that does not have a raise the age law. To change raise the age. Right now, 17, 16 and 17 year olds are actually treated as adults if they commit a nonviolent crime. You want to know something? We need to change that. We need to understand Martin Luther King's logic, Martin Luther King's talk. And we have to make sure that these reforms are changed. Because I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the other state that does not have a raise the age law uh, is North Carolina. You want to know something? We should celebrate North Carolina as the birthplace of flight. Remember the Wright brothers? But we shouldn't be replicating them when it comes to criminal justice reform. So what we need to do is change all that. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, in order to help lead the fight, I stood with Reverend Foy and we released a report. We understand that the raise the age issue uh, is an issue of fairness. It's an issue of justice. But it's also an economic issue. Because when we throw a young kid in prison, subject them to abuse, make sure they don't graduate from high school, make sure they don't have a good job when they graduate. We're hurting our economy single-handedly and losing billions of dollars a year. That money should be spent on after-school programs. That money should be spent on job training. That money should be spent on apprenticeship programs. That's the way we send a message to our young people uh, that we care. So I pledge to you today uh, that I'll be back at the end of the session and, and we'll celebrate. Uh, because we will join every other state except North Carolina and have a raise the age law here in New York State. Because we stand here today and Martin Luther King wouldn't want anything else. Because when I look around this room, we have to join hands together and the only way we'll see the light and reach the top of the mountain is together. Thank you all. God bless. Thank you. And as we said in Washington, we went to Washington not just to, not just to lay out an agenda that the Trump administration had to respond to, but we went to Washington also to send a signal to many of our friends, our so-called friends, in a party that many of us support. Well, we need to do the same here locally. There are Democrats that do not support Raise the Age. There are a handful of them. And we're going to be reaching out to everyone, Democrat and Republican alike, 
to say, if you believe that it's acceptable to lock our children up, we think it's acceptable to take your job away from you and give it to people that will stand up for real justice. Notwithstanding party affiliation, we have a justice agenda, and that agenda will not be hamstrung by partisanship. A progressive leader in this state, in this city, she is a friend and sister of the National Action Network. She is one of the most prolific policy wonks out here. I hope that's not, I hope that's a, a compliment. And she is the Manhattan Borough President. Let's receive our good friend, Gail Brewer. Thank you very much. And I want to say it's, it's uh, Reverend Sharpter's leadership, but as Mr. Foy, it's the wonderful daughters, Dominique and Ashley. And I remember the amazing Teresa Freeman. May she rest in peace. Hey. It's, it's the people who make up NAM, who make this organization so extraordinary. So thank you all for waiting and for being patient and for understanding. That's why I love being here, one of the main reasons. Um, in this new era we are entering, we can learn much from Dr. King's approach, his approach to the future, and to preaching for social change. His was a spirit of two things at once, optimism and action, just like in this room. He didn't always know if the course he advocated was the right course. He discussed, he prayed, he debated, he mediated. But his bias was toward taking action against injustice, just like all of you in the room, in the spirit of hope and optimism, because he knew that action, and action alone, is what bends the arc of history toward justice. As a minister, a Baptist minister, Dr. King took the language of the pulpit to the streets, and that pairing of religion and constitutionality made his cause all the more righteous. These times remind me of the saying, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. We are in a more secular age now, but we have never, never, never needed your voice more. Today we face new challenges. You know what they are. You've heard them from the great people who've spoken here today. We can revisit Dr. King's approach as we cope with a national leadership that clearly does not value equality and justice for all. We've seen leaders like this before. We know what it takes to take action to stand up against them. So as we all join you to revisit Dr. King's words and use them in our current affairs, that's what we must do. And perhaps with those words, we can face the future with a measure of optimism. I just want to give you one example of, maybe we're up against it, but maybe it's humor if there is such a thing. Recently a reporter went to Bryant Park and he interviewed 35 people on the benches, New Yorkers. I don't know what this says about us. He said, what do you prefer? the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Oh my goodness, 34 people said Affordable Care Act. Only one gentleman, African American, said, what the hell, aren't they the same thing? <laughs> the reason I give this example is we have so much work to do and that says more than even what I will say today because you understand what I'm saying. We have, we would lose millions and billions of dollars if in fact we lose ACA in the state of New York. In three days all alone in December, 55,000 people signed up. At the end of this month, you can still sign up by calling 311, so please sign up for ACA. So. We can take action for the justice, but we need to do it now. Thank each and every one of you for what you do, and thank you for being so welcoming at NAM. I deeply appreciate it. Happy King Day. Thank you, Borough President Brewer, and thank you for your patience. Um, we have been joined also by another friend, another progressive, 
but she is a progressive in Washington, which is a little bit different than being a progressive in New York. When she gets off the plane, she's got to make sure her vest is on, the glasses, the shades, and she's got to cut through a whole lot of stuff to get where she's going safely. So we appreciate her leading in Washington. We appreciate her on the forefront of issues like civil rights and women's rights and all kinds of rights, LGBTQ rights. All the rights that we enjoy as a people, she is in Washington upholding and fighting to maintain those rights. And she's gonna need our support even more now. Even more now. So let us encourage her with a hearty round of applause she is our friend and sister, Representative Carolyn Maloney. Thank you so much, Reverend Foy, and I'm Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. I represent parts of the East Side, parts of Astoria, Queens, and Greenpoint, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And I am part of the resistance movement in Washington. And we've all got to be part of that resistance movement. And I'm so pleased today to be joining the man that President Obama calls America's minister, Reverend Al Sharpton. And I, I'd like to thank him and the National Action Network, which has over 100 chapters. This is a national movement all across America doing good work. And we've seen that every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, this organization is out there feeding people. And Reverend Sharpton has taken the principles of Dr. King and applied them to the modern civil rights struggle. And people know wherever there's an injustice, you'd better call Al. Because when there's a problem, you call Al Sharpton, he acts. He organizes the community. He calls me and like-minded people to get behind the cause. Now, now today we celebrate and honor the life of Reverend Martin Luther King, uh, not just because he inspires us, because his life, his words, his works instruct us. And we don't just revere him, we also remember what he taught us and recall his lessons. And one of his most important lessons is that we don't need to hear sermons, we need to see deeds. And that's why Reverend Sharpton listened to him, and he was up in Washington marching Saturday before the march this Saturday. He was there before. And then he was in Baltimore starting another program on Sunday to launch a new initiative to help city schools and redevelop the community. That would, that's what I call living Dr. King's dream. Now, Dr. King, he mobilized this country and with a famous march on Washington of one million people who marched to demand justice, jobs, and freedom. Well, we're going to be marching this Saturday in Washington, and every year, every year, I march with Dr. Uh, Reverend Sharpton and John Lewis, who is a civil rights leader in Selma, Alabama, where we march to remember the dream of Martin Luther King. And last year, President Obama marched with us over that Selma Bridge. What a change in 50 years for human rights and civil rights, but it's not enough. But we can all get on the subway, and we can all get on the bus, and go down to Dag Hammershaw Plaza this coming Saturday, next Saturday, and it, join in the march in New York City uh, for justice. And, and we can do that by getting on the 2nd Avenue subway at 96th Street and going down. And, and in living in the spirit of Dr. King, I'm not going to talk about how great he is. I'm going to talk about how he's inspired me to improve lives. And for the last 20 years, I worked to build that 2nd Avenue subway down to 63rd Street, down to Wall Street on the Cuse train. And I pledge to you to work with the National Action Network, Reverend Foy and Reverend Sharpton, to build a 2nd Avenue subway up to 125th Street. Now, earlier the gentleman talked about 20,000 jobs. 
The Second Avenue subway has already created 16,000 jobs and over $8 million in good wages and salaries and over $2.5 billion, according to the regional plan, in economic activity. Think about that. It's the gift that will keep on giving to the Harlem community Amen. in creating jobs, quality of life, reducing commute times, making your travel on the subway more enjoyable. We all know the Lexington Avenue line is the most overcrowded in the nation. It is time to build the Second Avenue subway up to 125th Street and make the federal government pay for at least a quarter of it. So let's join hands give monthly reports on the progress or lack thereof, and build that subway for our people helping the economic development in this neighborhood. Secondly, I heard the talk about the number of African Americans that are losing their homes due to the financial crisis and the mortgage mishandlement. That wasn't an individual's fault. That was financial institutions that sold products that were not right to people. And when I go back to Washington, I talk to the good reverend from Brooklyn, but he's going to work here in Manhattan too. I'm going to see if we can set up a program to help people stay in their homes, to get the federal government, which our leader showed how beautifully it helped her parents and her life, get the federal government to work with us with services to help people stay in their home. So today I honor Martin Luther King by my own commitment to create jobs, economic justice, opportunity, and fairness to all. And we thank Reverend Martin Luther King for teaching us to believe in change and to believe in dreams. And I'm adding two dreams to this neighborhood. Let's work together in the spirit of Dr. King to help our community, help our brothers and sisters, and help our great nation. Thank you for having me once again to this important remembrance. It's so important to me to be welcomed so warmly by so many of you. Thank you. You've been given our marching orders. Thank you. Katrina, Katrina, Jefferson, our New York liaison. We have a good brother, two good brothers left, and a good sister. We're going to save the best for last, and I'm going to get rid of the brothers. And I'm going to go by protocol. The first is my home state senator, Jesse Hamilton from Brooklyn. We can, we can do better than that for Jesse Hamilton from Brooklyn. I know you all remember the boogie down Brooklyn remarks, so maybe that's what you're holding, holding on to. But he's a good brother, and he's here with us, and we're grateful to have him. Jesse, Senator Jesse Hamilton. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I am New York State Senator Jesse Hamilton from Brooklyn, representing uh, Sunset Park, Gowanus, Park Slope, Prospect Heights, Crown Heights, Flatbush, and beautiful Brownsville. And I stay here before you today, even though I represent the Bronx. My first job was right across the street here, in Mighty Jim's Deli. And because of Dr. King, I worked hard. I went from Carlo Hayes High School, and back then it was a two-fair zone, so I had to walk across the bridge to work over here. And then I applied to college, and thank you for Dr. Martin Luther King, I was able to get financial aid and scholarships. After college, I was able to move on to get my MBA in finance. And then because of Dr. King and his, and his legacy, I was able to go to law school to get my law degree, and now I'm an attorney. And because of Dr. King's legacy, stand before you, the first person of color to chair the Senate Banking Committee in New York State. So good times are going to be coming for MBEs, MWBEs, as far as getting financial funding, not being redlined for mortgages, 
being able to go to a bank rather than a check cashing place. So we have to change the dynamic on how financial services are being put into our community. Rather than giving subsidies to developers to gentrify, we need to get subsidies to developers to build truly, truly affordable housing. And Dr. King once said, human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward the goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering and struggle, the tireless exertions and past concern of dedicated individuals. I've only been a New York State Senator for two years. I didn't run for the Senate just to get along. I ran for the Senate to make change in our community. The first thing we did was introduce legislation for Mental Health 101. That every teacher in New York State take a mental health course to identify our kids who have mental issues versus behavioral issues. Number one is to address the fact that the second leading cause of death in our community from 15 to 35 is what? Suicide. Suicide. And so we have to address that fact. And so what we're going to do is I will put King's Court to action by taking the lead to pass legislation on raising the age in New York State. Raising the age is not just about civil rights, it's about human rights. Every year, every year, 33,000 young men of color are put in adult prisons who are 16 and 17. 33,000 young men and women. The vast majority of them are arrested for minor crimes. 74% are misdemeanors. And if you hop the train style, yeah. <laughs> it, for $2.50, right. you could be incarcerated. Right. So we'll spend $100,000 to incarcerate you for jumping the train style for two fifty. dollars That makes no sense to me. $275. $275, I'm sorry about it, $275. I corrected it. Mama said $275. That's right. For $275. <laughs> as many of you, as many as 70% of the youth in juvenile system are affected with mental disorder. And one in five suffer from a mental illness so severe to their impair their ability to function as a young person and grow up into responsibility. The vast majority of the arrests of 16 and 17 year olds are for nonviolent crimes, which are 87% are arrested for nonviolent crimes. And the National Prison Rape Elimination Commission reports that youth, youth in prison, the 16 and 7 year olds, and 17 year olds, have the highest risk of sexual assault. Added to that, if you're 16 and 17 years old, and you're in an adult prison, you're 36 more times to commit suicide. So rather than being rehabilitated, you're debilitated. Okay, your, psych, your psychological component is degraded. And when I think about suicide, and I think about young men and women being put in prison with adults, I think of Khalif Browder. Right. Khalif Browder was 16 years old when he was arrested for allegedly stealing a backpack. He spent three years in prison, never convicted, never went to trial. We have 33,000 people like Khalif Browder now in prison. It's a national disgrace, sister, you're right. right. And so, out of the three years, he spent two years in solitary confinement. That's right, that's right. That was and when he was released, the horrors of prison right. still haunted him. That's right. Still haunted him to the fact that he committed suicide. Why should a young man arrested for a backpack spend three years in prison Two years of that in solitary confinement, to only come out, not going to trial, not being convicted, and being traumatized so much, and not getting the mental health that he needed, that he committed suicide. We have to end that. And then when you think about the cost, to incarcerate these young men and women, we're spending $120 million a year. 
$120 million a year. And when I go to state and I see other people in uh, the legislature, some of my upstate senators say, well, if we take away 16 and 17 years going into the prison system, what are we going to do about jobs in upstate New York? Our young men and women cannot be economic development for upstate prisons. And after we pay all this money, I met a young man who came to my office and we got him a job. He was incarcerated at 16. He said, we weren't educated because when his teacher got upset, he wouldn't educate us. There were no prison guards around, so when fights broke out, I was scared for my life. And then when they released me from prison, after spending $100,000, all I got was a $40 ticket for a bus, a plastic bag, and said, get on out of here. If we could spend all that money to incarcerate them, why can't we let them leave with dignity? Give them a suit, give them a bag, say you are worth something, say you are somebody, before we just release them into the system. To only come back later on because there's no support for them. We have to change that. So, myself and the IDC, and Senator Bumman at Montgomery, we're going to be meeting with the Criminal of Justice Reform Advocates to develop a proposal that enhances public safety of removing 16 and 17 year olds from the prison, prison system. Now, I made some of my moves because Donald Trump is not a president. The Congress is controlled by Republicans. The U.S. Senate is controlled by Republicans. And the New York Senate is controlled by Republicans. We have to work both sides of the aisle yeah. to make changes. Yes. Hard times are coming. And I'm here to say before you, I'm going to fight for our young men and women. Yes. Because it's for the grace of God, there goes out. So we have work to do. As I said before, I thought after Barack Obama, things would be uh, here. Good times are coming. Good times are going to stay. But reality is slap us in the face again. And so we have to fight for everything we get. And we have to fight for our children with, the, with education. So right now in Brooklyn, what we've done for the first time in public housing, we created the campus. With a half a million dollars from the borough president, we're teaching our kids coding. And we're teaching our kids coding. Because my son said to me, he said, Daddy, I said, what, son? He said, I'm going to delay going to college. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, wait a minute. And he said, I said, why? He said, because my friend, older brother, with a high school diploma and a coding certificate is making $80,000 a year. So I said, why aren't we doing that? So we went to Howard Houses in Brooklyn. And now we have coding for our young children. We have workforce development for their parents. We have anti-gang violence. And we have the wellness center where we have psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers, because we all got problems. It doesn't matter how we deal with it. And now, students are telling their other friends, I'm doing coding. You know, and I love it. And then, so they're telling their friends, and I'm, I'm getting called from principal saying, I want to get coding for my kids too. So if we don't fight for our children's education, they will not have the skill sets to stay here and live in our community. So let's keep the struggle going. No justice. No peace. No justice. No peace. God bless you all. This next speaker is my brother from the Boogie Down Bronx. He is a former White House staffer, a special assistant to President Barack Obama. He is currently a New York State Assembly member. He is currently running for vice chair of the DNC. Yes. He is currently a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is currently an activist. And he is my man. Put your hand together for Michael Assemblyman, Michael Blake. In the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies or the silence of our friends. The word reminds us to be 
not just listeners of the word. I wish we just had some folk with me right now, but, but doers of the word. We are here on this day, yes, to celebrate the birth of Dr. King and his life and his legacy, but let's understand that we don't need people who are just gonna be here to celebrate when it's King Day. Yeah. We, we need for you to understand that there's someone that's hungry and hurting tonight. Will you be out there to help them? We, we need you to understand that there's someone that may not have a house to sleep in tonight. Will you be out there to help them? There's someone that's gonna get arrested for a crime they didn't commit tonight. Will you be there for their family? Will, will you be there for the sick and shut in who need you tonight when they don't have anyone out there? I'm looking for the people that will be doers of the word. When you understand what, what King was reminding us, it, it, it wasn't just to talk about it, but it's to be about it. When we understand that we're here at the House of Justice, Reverend Sharpton is the epitome of putting in the work. Minister Kirsten John Ford puts in the work. Dominique and Ashley put in the work. Minister Hardy put in the work. We're looking for folks that are dedicated. That's why you're here. You're, you're not here for the house of sitting on the sideline. This is not the house House of just being complacent or convenient. The house of justice requires work. Justice requires being in the vineyard. Justice requires that your friends and family may not be there when you need there. Justice requires being out there when the cameras are gone. Justice requires will you be there when someone doesn't believe in you, when they don't stand with you, when they don't fight with you. That's what justice requires. Justice calls us right now to understand that if you are willing to understand that hoses were put on our people in the 50s and 60s, they'll stand up for the Native American brothers and sisters who had hoses put on them. Understand that right now, I need for people to understand that you are doers of the world. You can't just be here casually and be convenient about it. When, whenever I see Mother Carr, I'm reminded that we have more work that needs to be done because if someone can say I can't read 11 times, I don't understand how you can sit there comfortably and wonder why we are doing the work. We're doing the work because of Eric Garner. We do the work because of Khalif Browder. We do the work for all the names that will be named and the names that will come after because someone has to stand up for them. What will you do to be dedicated to the work and be consistent about this? You don't need someone just to be a parking lot Christian right now. To, to be casual and be out there on the outside. I'm looking for the folks that are going to put in the work when no one else is there with you. I'm looking for the person that understands the silence of my friends. So will you stand there for legislation? Will, will you stand there for the marches? Will you stand there for the phone calls? Will you, will you be there for the meetings in the, in the middle of the week? Will, will you stand there and make sure you sign the, the petitions? Will you get on the bus when it doesn't seem like it's convenient? Will you wake up at 3 in the morning to stand with someone? Don't just talk to me about what happens on one day, every day. Requires the work. We sometimes get com complacent and with our historical reference. The, the march on Washington was talking about jobs, and, and you understand that King had given that speech a hundred times. But understand, sometimes your friends will try to cut your legs short when you're putting in the work. If it wasn't for Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, and Walter Fontroy said, let him give the full speech. If it wasn't for Mahalia Jackson that said, tell them about the dream. If they weren't being consistent about what was happening on that day, and for five more years being engaged, but understand that it didn't just end on his birthday, it didn't just end on a holiday, it continues tomorrow. It continues the next day. Will you be there to help the sisters when they have the march on Washington on Saturday? Will you be consistent for the young people who need you right now? Will you take the 
the time to mentor someone? Will you take the time to stand up for somebody? Will you understand that it's about being doers of the word? So I'll leave you with this. I, I'm, I'm grateful for a king day. We're excited for a king day. But we understand that king is reminding us about being doers of the word. You can talk about I have a dream. But the word that I re remember talks about the dreams. All the dreams that came for those that before it gave them a vision to go do something. So I hope someone will wake up and go to work tomorrow. Go to work the next day in the vineyard. Stand up for somebody. Live up their dream. Give them hope again. Give them justice again. Because if you are a doer of the word, you'll be a doer of the word. front lines of stopping bloodshed and if Dr. King were alive today he's not because of a assassin's bullet because of gun violence Dr. King died because of gun violence Dr. King's mother died many of us don't know this but Dr. King's mother was assassinated in a church sitting at the organ playing the organ by a madman's gun so Erica is on the front line doing the work that was just preached about. So we need to get her back out there to do it some more. So let's receive at this time our sister, Life Camp Inc. Love your life, respect yourself, no justice, no peace. Keep hope alive, we shall overcome Erica Ford. Week. And Peace Week is something that we, in 2010, there was two young girls who were shot down in the street in Linden Boulevard, Linden Plaza, by this young man like they were savages in the street. And me and Brother A.T. was like, you know, the point that is getting to where girls are being shot, something critical must be done. And we said we're calling for, you know, in memory of Martin Luther King, who was the key to nonviolence, that we want to say to our brothers and sisters, take a second. Let's all for one week take a second and take personal responsibility for the life that we give to the violence that happens around us. Because a lot of times we have the ability to either defuse or infuse situations. And we came with Peace Week and we've been doing it for, this is the seventh year. And not only is it the seventh year, but a uh, year before last, it was institutionalized and made part of the New York City calendar, so it is an official part of the New York City calendar, right. and it is because of, of Dominique and Ashley and Rachel and A.T. Mitchell from Man Up and Tamika Mallory and Kefra and all of them brothers and sisters who are out there doing the work that Peace Week is still alive and the work that we're doing is still alive. Yeah. And the other thing that we started here at MLK, you know, all the politicians come here on MLK Day, and Christine Quinn, who was running for city council at that time, was walking in the door, and I was on a mic right here, and I said, and I know Christine Quinn is going to start a task force to deal with violence in New York City. Right, Christine Quinn? And she had nothing else to do but say yes, talk to my people. And, and from that came a task force. From that came the New York City Crisis Management System, where it started out with five sites. Now there is 17 sites in New York City and over 52 organizations. One of the sites right here, our sister, our strong sister, Aisha Sekou, running it right up the block. And one of the main things that we deal with is the question of the trauma that is impacted on us all on a day-to-day -day basis. And when we look at the disease called violence, whether it's Donald Trump, 
whether it's the police officer, whether it's the young brother with the gun, whether it's the domestic violence in the house, whether it's the miseducation in the school system, where it's the poor and adequate health care that we're giving, when we look at the disease of violence, we help people heal and not criminalize them. So I want us all during Peace Week to begin to look at our own infected self and begin to deal with the stories and the things that we hold on to that separate us from being great. Because when we separate ourselves from one another, we separate ourselves from ourselves. And the reason why I can stand here and say that is because I was not only infected by the disease, but I was in critical condition. And unless I heal myself from the poison of my own self, I would not be able to be who I am today. Not that I'm somebody, you know, but I had to get rid of the jealousy, get rid of the anger, get rid of the judgment, get rid of the comparison, get rid of holding on to some. She looked at me like this, or when I was at the meeting, she ain't want to sit next to me, because it's easy to talk about the police that's pulling the trigger, but let's talk about the disunity that we create amongst our own I love y'all. Let's keep doing it. You gotta love Erica. Because if you don't, she gonna make you love her. So you just might as well just do it anyway. She is a young leader in the National Action Network. She's coming up, she's making her moves, and she has some things to say. And she's no stranger to any of us. She is the liaison to New York City chapter. So if you are in the New York City chapter and you do not clap for her, then you might get a new committee assignment. Let's receive at this time my sister, Katrina Jefferson. Thank you all so much for your patience and being with us on this wonderful um, MLK holiday. We've had heard from some really great speakers, but I want to bring to you now um, a woman who is no stranger to the House of Justice. She's been here every Saturday at every rally, standing for justice, standing for change, not only, change, not only for her son, but for others um, affected by gun violence as well. Let's give a round of applause to Mother Gwen Carr as she comes, the mother to her daughter. today and I want to thank Reverend Sharpton and the whole NAN family for giving us this platform and allowing us to come and voice and to celebrate Martin Luther King. I remember Martin Luther King, I was in high school when he was killed and I'll never forget that day. And being a young person, sometimes you don't, you're not fully into politics. You hear your parents talking about it, but you're not into it. But now his death, after my mother and my father, they were so upset about it. And I wonder why, they, you know, this is really upsetting them. So now this brought me into it. And, I am, and after that, when I went to college, I always talked about him. I read up about him. When we had to do speeches, uh, he was the, my topic. And sometimes I would think I would get away with it because I had a professor, never forget his name is Dr. Raffanello. So I said, well, this is a white man. He's not going to know too much about Martin Luther King. You know, it's kind of fresh then. And I said, so I could, you know, just write a little bit, say a little bit about him and, you know, get away with it. But he would ask each one of us, well, who are you going to speak about? We had to give a speech on an authoritative figure. So I said, I'm going to do Martin Luther King. He says, well, you know, that's a broad topic. What, do you, what are you going to talk about? Are you going to talk about the way he uh, dealt with white people? Are you going to de deal, talk about his speech? Are you going to talk about this? I was so shocked. He knew everything about Dr. Martin Luther King, even at that time. So I says, you know, I really got to catch up. I got to, you know, this man, if I'm trying to get an A, 
I gotta really do this right, <laughs> you know. So this really made me get into the reading and the studying of Martin Luther King. And I really used to love his speech on, you know, the, on the march on Washington. And I never forget that one about the promissory note that he wrote. The, he said they, there was a promissory note for the America, for the people. And it came back to us insufficient funds. So I used to say, well, what do you do with a, a promissory note that comes back insufficient funds? You take it back to the maker, and you tell them to make these funds available. And this is what we have to do as a people. We have to take this check back and say, make it good. You know. And now, even though the new regime is coming in, this is what we're going to have to tell them. You may try to bully us, but we are going to fight back. You know, because a bully, they want to beat up on you. They don't want to fight. You to stand there and take it, and we not doing that. We going to gather, we going to galvanize, and we are going to beat the opposition because as a people, we're not going to go all abroad first. We're going to start right here in New York. As previous speakers said, it starts at home. Some people only vote in the big election. Bad move. We have to start in our neighborhood. We have to vote for our councilmen and the ones who's making law in our state. That's the way that we get it taken care of. So today, as we celebrate, and I am so glad that I still got the support of you for my son, because now it's coming up on two and a half years. We still haven't yet got justice. The new regime is coming in. We don't know if we're going to get justice, but I still have hope. I have, you know, and as Martin Luther said, like I heard a young brother speak at the march on Saturday. Who is worse, the kid who's afraid of the dark or the man right. who's afraid to walk in the light? And that has to be us. And that, to me, speaks of courage. And what is courage? Courage is consistent and commitment to walk out on faith. I think. So this is what we have to do. And on this day, we must not embarrass Dr. Martin Luther King's dream and not let it become a nightmare. Thank you so much. Y'all should all stand to your feet. You just heard the initial trial sermon of Minister Gwen Carr. Before we close out with a musical selection from Brother Michael Knight, we have a very brief announcement from the Director of Community Affairs for, for the Manhattan Borough President, Ms. Athena Moore. You've seen her before, you're gonna see a lot more of her again but she has some information to bring to us briefly now, and then we're gonna wrap up. Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure being here, and certainly in the house of the Reverend Al Sharpton. Again, Athena Moore in Harlem, uh, doing the work as a public servant and an advocate for social justice, and I could not not stop by National Action Network on Martin Luther King's birthday weekend because not only has this house provided so much leadership for us, but we know all of the electors in Harlem have a responsibility and an obligation to make sure they're reflecting the needs of the community. And through my office, we have continued to do that through a storefront on 125th Street. Many of you have visited us as we help people to prevent evictions in their homes or you been to us as we work to advocate against affordable housing and development in the community, or you've worked with me as I've worked with small businesses to ensure that they had the proper supports and protections for their businesses. It was referenced earlier that we have to have this be a time of healing, and certainly in Dr. King's legacy, he talked about having us go for the community in a way that we have to fight for change and we have to resist the current systems that exist. I want to tell you that my work in doing gun violence prevention through our storefront has continued. We have allocated over $27 million 
to the borough of Manhattan through my office, and that's going to continue through anything that I do in the community. We've also fought against things that have been rising in our community. I've been talking to folks lately about Harlem rising because I have a vision that, like the Phoenix, that we are rising. It is not doom or gloom, and Trump will have you to believe that all of our future is clouded by misery. But it's not about doom or gloom. It's about Harlem rising. Will y'all join me and say Harlem rising? Harlem rising. Harlem rising. And we have to confront rising inequality. We have to confront rising homelessness. We have to confront rising rates across the world of incarceration. We have to fight the power that be. And we have to do it in a way that King would. King went for young people. He was a young person when he started his leadership. And I am next generation and a young person who will continue to go for this community. So as you hear my voice, you'll know I'll be working with Dominique, I'll be working with Reverend Sharpton, I'll be working with Kirsten Ford, and all of you. But I cannot leave here without saying that women have to continue to be at the forefront of this fight as well. Okay? And when we talk was one of the first, and we know that Dorothy Hyatt, those are some of the leaders and the women whose shoulders I stand on. And so as I continue to fight, I'm fighting for mental health, my mother was mentally ill. I'm fighting for social justice and substance abuse prevention. You heard Andrea Cousin Stewart talk earlier about the GI Bill. When folks come home for the war, they need jobs. My father came home for the Korean War, did not have a job to raise his family, and we found future plans are. <laughs> but we're going to be seeing a lot more of her. Yes. Uh, we're going to bring up Brother Michael Knight to bring us, to close us out, but I do want to say one brief, one brief word. You know, I've been getting myself in a lot of trouble lately because I've been doing something that I was taught and raised to do here at the House of Justice. And that is to hold people accountable, whether they are friend or foe. Yes. My job as an activist, my job as the Northeast Regional Director of the National Action Network is to make sure that the interests of our people are put first. <laughs> that the things that we need in our community are front and center in the discussion. Yes. And sometimes when you do that, you upset the apple cart. Yes. People that think you're supposed to be their friend just because you're supposed to be their friend get upset. And when you're talking to people that, that people think you're not supposed to be talking to, they get upset. Well, you're just going to have to keep getting upset. Because at the end of the day, I'm here to save young black lives. And I don't care about partisan politics. I don't care if you have a D in front of your name or an R in front of your name. Children are at stake. You are going to be held accountable. You cannot like me all you want to. I've been not liked by people I like more than you. 
It's not going to bother me that much. But I'm not going to, to sleep at night with my conscience weighted down by inactivity, by my conscience weighted down because I'm friends with so-and-so and I don't want them to be mad at me. Whatever God had for me, it ain't that. So if you're upset with me, go home, have a cup of tea, think about it, and let's fight again tomorrow. My brother, our brother, to take us out in song, let's receive brother Michael Knight, the New York Cowboy. Well, I had a whole speech and all of that, but it's late. <laughs> Let me minister to you in song. Go ahead, brother.
Twitter.com. One more, one more, one more. No, no. <laughs> the news. My music and my books are on the New York Cowboy.com or the NY Cowboy.com. I have a series called Street Stories NYC. There's 38 books in the series, and I I uh, cater to women, so make sure you check out the books. All right, now, brothers, the family show. <laughs> that it? Be good. Thank you. Let us all stand. Take the hand of the person standing next to you. Repeat after me, we are an African people. Robbed of our homeland. Robbed of our names. Our language. Our culture. Our self-respect. But we shall rise. Never to fall again. Mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. No justice, no peace. Don't leave out of here without hugging the person whose hand you're holding now, unless you don't like them. Then you hug them and kiss them. Your iPhone, iPad, 